Um, welcome to the Center for the Study of Race, Politics, and Culture. I want to thank you all for coming out. How many people are in this building for the very first time? Very good. Um, we hope you'll come back. There are some flyers at the door um, letting you know what else is going on in the rest of the quarter and also a uh, sign-up sheet so that you can be on our listserv so you'll know about other exciting events like this. Um, I'm Tracy Matthews. I'm the Associate Director here at the Center. And um, this is the first episode of Press Talks for the quarter. Press stands for Comparative Race and Ethnic Studies, uh, which is an undergraduate major and minor that is uh, sponsored by the Center that was uh, ushered into place by Professor Ramon Gutierrez when he was the director of the Center. Uh, and we have uh, graduate lecturers. Every year we award six lectureships to advanced graduate students to teach a course of their own making. Um, one of our lecturers last year asked us about the, or came up with the idea of inviting scholars and artists to work whose books or whose work was being taught in a current press course, and thus the idea for the press talks. So we want to bring in scholars um, and, and artists and take, the, um, take their work out of the classroom and bring it into a public forum. So um, welcome. We'll have another one coming up this quarter on December 1st, first with Puerto Rican writer Eduardo Lalo. Um, but today we're here to welcome Professor Ernesto Chavez. Um, Daniel Webb is one of our graduate student lecturers this year, and it was his idea to invite Professor Chavez uh, to speak to us this afternoon. Uh, Daniel is a PhD candidate in the Department of History, and he's also a graduate scholar in residence at the Newberry Library. So this quarter, Daniel's teaching a course, a crest course, called Topics in U.S.-Mexico Borderlands History. And so I'm going to turn it over to Daniel now to introduce Professor Chavez. And thanks again for coming out. Good afternoon. Uh, thank you all for coming out for this event. Uh, I'm very delighted uh, to introduce uh, Dr. Ernesto Chavez, who is an associate professor in the Department of History at the University of Texas, El Paso. Dr. Chavez received his PhD in U.S. History from UCLA in 1994. Uh, his specialization is Chicano Latino Studies, with an emphasis on the construction of identity, culture, and community. He has published two books. His first book is Miraza Primero, My People First, Nationalism, Identity, and Insurgency in the Chicano Movement of Los Angeles, 1966-1978. And his second book is The U.S. War with Mexico, A Brief History with Documents. He is currently working on a critical biography of Mexican-born actor Ramon Novato. Dr. Chavez is a past member of the National Council of the American Studies Association, and he currently serves on Azadlan, a journal of Chicano Studies, of the National Council of the Western Historical Association, and is the Ford Diversity Fellowships Regional Liaison for Arizona, Arizona, New Mexico, and West Texas. During 2014 and 2015, uh, he was at the UCLA Institute of American Cultures Chicano Studies Research Center. Um, he is a recipient of the American Historical Association's 2014 Equity Award, given to individuals who have demonstrated an exceptional record in the recruitment and retention of studies, students and new faculty from racial and ethnic groups underrepresented within the historical profession. Um, it's my great honor to introduce Dr. Ernesto Chavez. Thank you. Thank you, Daniel, and thank you everybody for being here. Um, I want to thank um, Daniel Webb and the Center for the Study of uh, Race, Politics, and Culture for inviting me. I especially want to thank uh, Dora Epson and Tracy Matthews and uh, Sarah Toomey. Um, and I, I'm delighted to be here. Um, um, so what I want to do today is I want to talk a little bit about um, this, kind of expand on this uh, idea that I had in this book, The U.S. War with Mexico, a brief, a brief history with documents. Um, and so I'll begin. Uh, when I was a kid, my brother Arturo told me that Mexico had won its war with the United States. So I was quite young and growing up in East Los Angeles in the midst of the Chicano movement. I believed him. Of course, I did not stop to think that we were living um, in the United States, why we were living in the United States, and the fact that we primarily spoke English rather than Spanish at home. Now, for, as a young, proud Chicano, I think I was a proud Chicano at that age, um, 
My vision of the past was shaped by my present. This memory came back to me years later when in graduate school I chose to report on Gene Brock's book, uh, Mexico Views Manifest Destiny, in Gary Nash's seminar on the antebellum U.S. I preface my remarks with that, uh, with that memory, and uh, of course people didn't understand what was going on um, because I failed to explain why I had that perception of the past. Um, needless to say, the U.S.-Mexico War has loomed large in my memory uh, since I was a child. That's when, given the opportunity to write what became the U.S. War with Mexico, A Brief History of the Documents, I jumped at the chance because it was my way to explore that complex meaning and perhaps to purge it from my psyche. Alas, that was not to be, and instead the book became a meditation on the war. In light of this personal history and scholarly endeavor, what I want to do today is to revisit this conflict by thinking about how historians, writers, Mexican-American and Chicano activists, politicians, and artists have remembered it, used it to understand their present, and instilled it with new meaning. Now, in order to understand, or the, perhaps the, I always have trouble with this, um, I don't know how to move it. Wait. The cursor at the bottom of that? Oh, I think it's this. Yes. Got it. Um, in order to understand how the war was remembered, we must first know a bit about it. Um, the U.S. war with Mexico is a pivotal event in American history. As a republic's first foreign war, it defined how the United States would emerge or would engage in warfare abroad thereafter. And this conflict also ensured that Americans would view Mexicans as the enemy, and thus set the pattern for the social construction of enemies in future U.S. military conflicts. It set the precedent for the acquisition of foreign territory, and in turn how conquered, how conquered population would be incorporated through the granting of U.S. citizenship into the nation, further establishing the United States as an imperial power. The war also led to greater sectional conflict, as evidence in the debate over the Wilmot Proviso, which proved to be one of the causes of the Civil War. Now, rather than blame one country or the other, it is imperative to understand that the war was a historical production, an outcome that was rooted in the origins and development of each nation. It resulted from the clash of two nations that developed differently, and ultimately, one became more powerful than the other. The long-term cause of the war was U.S. territorial expansion which serves to displace Indians, expand slavery, and uh, ensure that half of Mexico would be conquered. A more immediate reason for the war was the U.S. annexation of Texas in 1845, and its support for its claim that the border of the Republic, and later its, in, its, its, in its incarnation as a state, was at the Rio Grande there, rather than the traditional boundary recognized by Mexico, which was the Nueces River. When on April 26, 1846, U.S. troops crossed south of this line, the Mexican army, who viewed American actions as, as an invasion, attacked them. Uh, the news of the skirmish took some time to reach Washington, and shortly thereafter, on May 11th, President James K. Polk went before Congress and presented a list of grievances suggested for the war. Chief and most famously among them was that Mexico had, quote, shed American blood upon the American soil. Two days later, the United States declared war. Most of the fighting occurred between May 1846 and September 1847, and took place in three theaters of war, the northern and central parts of Mexico and the present-day American Southwest. Eventually, the U.S. Army invaded its enemy's capital city, and it held it until March of 1848. During that time, American forces published a newspaper, the American Star, and um, according to the city's residents, the U.S. invasion of the capital was a horrific experience for Mexicans. Meanwhile, Under Secretary of State and Chief Clerk Nicholas Triss was sent to Mexico with a draft treaty, and eventually he came up with this treaty that held fast to the United States territory ambitions refusing to yield on the Rio Grande boundary or on Mexican session of New Mexico and California, 
Texas had already been a, a state of the Union. Ultimately, ultimately, he gave up only on one U.S. stipulation. In return for San Diego, he dropped the demand to cross the Isthmus of Tehuantepec, unencumbered. The Polk administration's handling of the treaty, which was signed on February 2, 1848, coupled with the Senate debate over ratification, clearly demonstrates that Mexico had become a subjugated nation. After the treaty reached Washington on February 19th, the Polk sent a message to Congress commending, recommending two changes to the treaty. The insertion of a secret article protecting its validity and the elimination of Article 10, which declared that the United States would respect land grants given by the Spanish and Mexican government to residents of the ceded territories. This article was aimed specifically at protecting land grants in Texas, and Polk objected to it on the grounds that it would affect the property of, property of grants made by the Texas Republic following its independence. Although the president endorsed the treaty, the issues of territory and race expressed in the debate over slavery's expansion stalled ratification in the Senate. Ultimately, that body ratified the accord only after making the change that would have lasting and significant effects on the Mexican population in the ceded territories. By striking Article 10 from the treaty, the Senate ensured that Mexican residents in the ceded territories would lose their land grants. In addition, the Senate changed the wording of Article 9 by adding the citizenship guarantees of the Louisiana Purchase and adams onis Treaty. And Mexicans living in the ceded territory who chose not to retain their Mexican citizenship, quote, shall be incorporated into the Union of the United States and be admitted at a time to be judged by the Congress of the United States to the enjoyment of all the rights of citizens of the United States according to the principles of the Constitution. If the inhabitants of the territory stayed in their homes, they had one year to decide whether they wanted to remain Mexican citizens. If they made no effort to do so, they would automatically become U.S. citizens. Article 9 labeled Mexicans a conquered people. And they also became an in-between people who would be granted the rights of U.S. citizenship, but not always the ability to exercise them. Article 9 allowed for the construction of the Mexican-American race in the United States. This is something that Laura Gomez, of course, has written about in her book, Manifest Destinies. In addition, in 1848, U.S. citizenship was contingent on being a citizen of the state. A national citizenship would not emerge until 1868 in the, in the, with the 14th Amendment. Thus, Mexican Americans would become full-fledged citizens only when their homelands became states. Before that happened, Mexican Americans were given a second-class federal citizenship. Despite their second-class citizen status, Mexican Americans had the potential to become citizens, a fact that stood in stark contrast to the conditions of African Americans and Native Americans who would not gain this advantage until 1868 and 1887, respectively. By allowing Mexicans to become citizens, the Senate, in effect, made them white for legal purposes, since under the provisions of the Naturalization Act of 1790, only whites could become citizens. Of course, this was an, unsta an unstable whiteness with contingencies, and Mexican Americans would constantly have to fight to secure their rights. Thus, the U.S. war with Mexico set in motion processes that Mexican Americans, if not Latinos in general, still contend with today. Those first inhabitants of the ceded territories became foreigners in their native land, and many would remember the war as a dreadful time. Now, the first attempt to write the history of the war was initiated by a group of friends who were members of the Mexican elite. And I realize that I put this slide up a little early. Um, in late 1847, they gathered in Querétaro, in Mexico, for a tertulia. And the conversations that emerged were centered on the disgraces that Mexico had endured, and they lamented the nation's misfortune. They also discussed the battles that some had witnessed and the secrets that they knew. After some thought, the group decided that they would write down these facts 
and knowledge of the war. Thus emerged this collective first attempt to write the history of the war, which was titled in Spanish, Apuntos sobre la historia de la guerra entre México y los Estados Unidos, published in August 1848. It was translated a year later by Albert Ramsey, who was a colonel in the US Army, and appeared as the other side, or notes for the history of the war between Mexico and the United States. This collective's aim was to convey the truth in an impartial manner, and they believed that their history should be written, quote, without passion and without pay. Among the 15 authors were Ramon Alcaraz, Ignacio Ramirez, Alejo Barrero, Manuel Peino, and Ramon Ortiz. And Ramon Ortiz, it's interesting because I'm working on this um, biography of Ramon Navarro, and Ramon Ortiz was actually his great, great uncle, and perhaps his namesake. So like it, all the, all the uh, projects kind of blend into one kind of, um, who listed their names but did not sign their indivi individual en entries. The volume was comprehensive in its treatment of the war. It discussed its causes, detailed the various battles, and conveyed information about the American occupation of Mexico City. As would be expected, there was bitterness towards the United States, and the authors blamed it for the conflict. They began by saying, Quote, to contemplate the state of degradation and ruin to which the mournful war with the United States has reduced the Mexican Republic is painful. For them, the U.S. clearly had been the aggressor, as they said. From the acts referred to, it has been demonstrated to the very senses that the real and effective cause of the war that afflicted us with the spirit of the, was the spirit of aggrandizement of the United States of the North availing itself of its power to conquer us. Impartial history will someday illustrate forever the conduct observed by the Republic against all laws, divine and human, in an age that is called one of light, and which is notwithstanding the same as the former, one of force and violence. The authors concluded that as the United States troops departed, they left, quote, the theater of the victories and of our disasters. The war being over, there remained in our hearts a feeling of sadness for the evils that it had produced, and in our minds a fruitful lesson of how difficult it, it was it is when disorder, asperity, and anarchy prevail to uphold the defense and the salvation of a people. Apuntes made it clear that a group of Mexican elites remembered the war as an awful time in their history. The authors made their memory of the war into history. Almost, almost 40 years later, another Mexican author would convey her memory of the war, but this time through the writing of fiction. In The Squatter in the Dawn, Maria Amparo reads the burden, um, the book was published in 18, 1885, expressed her memories of the war via her character, Don Mariano Alamar. Alamar, the Don of the title, is pitted against a squatter, William Darrow, who is trying to impigeon the former's land. Although a fictionalized account, one could argue, of course, that these were Reese de Burden's sentiments, for she was a displaced Mexican elite woman she was born in Laredo, Baja California, in 1832, into a military family of the Mexican frontier. Reese met her husband, U.S. Army Captain Henry S. Burton, when an expedition of New York volunteers under his command arrived in La Paz, Baja California, in July of 1847, planning to take Lower California. By the time Burton and his men arrived, the city had surrendered and several citizens had capitulated and were granted U.S. citizenship. Following the signing of the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo, which excluded the said territory, those loyal to the United States, a total of 480 people, were granted refugee status and transported to Monterey in the upper part of the province. Among these was Reese and her mother. Although some returned to their homeland, 
the 16-year-old Reese remained and married the widower Burden, who was 12 years her senior. Following their marriage, Captain Burden was assigned to Monterey, then San Diego. Eventually, he, ordered, he was ordered east in 1849 and 1859 and on the eve of the Civil War. And eventually, he served as a brigadier general in the Union Army during that conflict. Um, and she went along with him, and he died uh, before she did um, in 1869. And so she was, left a, she was left a widow with two children uh, at 37 years old. After many failed business ventures, Reese de Burden died in poverty in Chicago in 1895. However, though she was a failed entrepreneur, today she is best known as the author of, of a play in two novels, the second of which was The Squatter and the Dawn. A commercial venture and a literary ideological enterprise, The Squatter and the Dawn is a fictionalized account of the fortunes of many California families. The main character is the Alamars, and we're a composite of several, of several of these clans. Like other Californios, Don Mariano is able to save his land grant, which was rejected by the state's land commission through appeal to district court, only to see the squatters on his land continue the litigation in the Supreme Court. When the novel begins in 1872, and new, new squatters have arrived while the Alamars are awaiting the high court's decision or the Attorney General's dismissal of the appeal. It ends four years later when, despite its validation, the Alamars lose, their ti their, lose title to their, to their rancho. The Squatter in the Dawn is full of Ruiz de Burden's analysis of the fate of Californios. Like the authors of The Other Side, Ruiz de Burton is also critical of the Mexican government. But her displeasure, as expressed by the character of Don Mariano, clearly reflects a different consciousness of a conquered people. This is evident in the Don's remembrance of the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo. As Rista Burden writes, I remember, calmly said Don Mariano, that when I first read the text of the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo, I felt a bitter resentment, resentment against my people, against Mexico, the mother country, who abandoned us, her children, with so slight a provision of obligatory stipulations for protection. But afterwards, upon my mature reflection, I saw that Mexico did as much as, as could have been reasonably expected at the time. In the very preamble of the treaty, the spirit of peace and friendship, which animated both nations, was clearly made, carefully made manifest. That spirit was to be the foundation of the relations between the conqueror and the conquered. How could Mexico have foreseen then that when scarcely half a dozen years should elapse, the trusted conquerors would, in Congress assembled, pass laws which were to be retroactive upon the defenselessness, helpless, conquered people in order to despoil them? The treaty said that our right would be the same as those enjoyed by all other American citizens. But you see, Congress takes very good care not to enact retroactive laws for Americans. Laws to take away from American citizens the property which they hold now already would recognize legal title. No, indeed. But they do so quickly enough with the Spanish Americans who were to enjoy equal rights, mind you, according to the Treaty of Peace. This is what seems to be a breach of faith, which Mexico could neither presuppose nor prevent. Now, Ruiz de Burden was clearly articulating the views of Californios when she penned those words. In so doing, she offered a counter-narrative of the dominant discourse of the time. Sadly, it was not until fairly recently that her words were recovered. Instead, the prevalent view of the war at the time was one fixated on manifest destiny. Now, perhaps the most, um, perhaps the most um, famous or the best example of this fixation on manifest destiny was Justin H. Smith's book, The War with Mexico. The War with Mexico, by the way, I was looking for a picture of Justin H. Smith, but I can only find a, 
He was a football player by the same name, I think, was for the 49ers. So I kept seeing those pictures, which I had no idea that there was a football player with his name. Um, kind of makes sense, 49ers, Mexican War, it's all connected. Um, so his book, The War with Mexico, was published in 1919, roughly 40 years after Reese de Burden's book. Smith's two-volume take on the war, based on his examination of more than 100,000 manuscripts, over 120,000 books and pamphlets, and 200 PR periodicals, was widely popular and won the Pulitzer Prize a year after it appeared. Although one could place Smith within the pantheon of progressive historians because of his scientific approach to history, we'll put scientific in quotes, uh, to history via his use of a vast array of both U.S. and Mexican sources. Unlike Charles Beard and uh, Fred Jackson Turner, some of the most famous of these progressive historians, Smith did not possess a doctorate. Instead, he had a BA and a master's degree from Dartmouth College and worked in publishing from 1881 to 1898. Following his employment at Gin and Company, Smith began his teaching career at his alma mater where he resigned in 1908 in order to pursue historical research. In 1911, he published The Annexation of Texas, and eight years later, his book on the Mexican War. Smith's, Smith's book not only blamed Mexico for the conflict, but it also justified its conquests. This made sense given that the author came of age in the decade in which the US launched its new empire via the Spanish-Cuban-American War. But, it also, but also because, as we know, the progressive era was deeply racist. In short, Smith was a man of his times, as opposed to Reese de Burden's Don Mariano Alamar, who lamented his people's conquests, Smith celebrated it. He concluded, of all conquerors, we were perhaps the most excusable, the most reasonable, the most beneficent. The Mexicans had come far short of their duty to the world. Being that what they are, that what they were, they had forfeited a large share of the national rights. Even Humboldt said that Mexico, quote, ought not to expect to withhold from the uses of civilization improvement, such so neglected like territories as New Mexico and California. Not merely an administration or a party, but the nation believed that our destiny called us there and felt ready to assume the high responsibility of taking possession. Besides, while others could perhaps be called, while others, while ours could perhaps be called a war of conquest, it was not a war for conquest. The really vital point. We found it necessary to require territory, for otherwise our claims and indemnity could not be paid. The conflict was forced upon us Yet, we refused to take advantage of our opportunity. Finally, we gave proof in the prosperity and usefulness of our new territories that our responsibility was amply met. Smith's take on the war and the United States' actions vis-a-vis -vis Mexicans was widely accepted, and of course, these racist ideas allowed for the continued disenfranchisement of and violence against the conquered and their brethren in the United States. Um, you know, when I was writing this book on the U.S. Mexico War, my little book um, with documents, um, I wanted to call it uh, the U.S. Mexico War History of Documents. And they told me, the press told me, no, no, there's no such thing as, that makes no sense, the U.S. Mexico War, you shouldn't call it that. They, they, you know, they went, we went back and forth. And so finally we decided that we were going to call it the U.S. War with Mexico. And in so doing, what I was kind of, what I, what I thought, I agreed to it because I was kind of, you know, using that title, right? I inserted the U.S. in the title. So in some ways, it was kind of my reaction to it. And it was a book, you know, Justin Swift's book was a book that I had read years ago in graduate school, and I was really taken with just uh, extremely racist kind of comments that are throughout the book, right? So I just thought that it was kind of a rejoinder against Justin Smith, not the football player. Um, <laughs> Um, in the early 20th century, Mexican-American groups and intellectuals challenged their unequal status. Among these were the League of Latin, Latin, United Latin American Citizens, 
Bolsonarism in life. And the Congreso del Pueblo de Habla Española, known as the Congreso of the Spanish Speaking Congress. And individuals like Carlos Castaneda, Javita Gonzalez, and George I. Sanchez. Well, Castaneda and Gonzalez wrote about Texas Sanchez, who was born in Albuquerque, New Mexico, in 1906, concentrated on his home, his home state. Educated at the University of New Mexico, where he earned his BA in 1930. He then went on to get an MA in psychology and education at the University of Texas the following year, and then continued to the, United, to the University of California, Berkeley, where he obtained a PhD in education administration in 1934. After receiving his doctorate, Sanchez returned to New Mexico and taught at his alma mater until 1940 when he departed for the University of, of Texas at Austin, where he was a professor in the Department of History and Philosophy of, of Education until his death in 1972. Sanchez was a scholar and an activist and worked with both LULAC and the Spanish-speaking Congress. His book, Forgotten People, A Set of New Mexicans, was, as he wrote, an interpretive study of the social and economic conditions faced by that sector of the population of New Mexico that is of Spanish extraction. Sanchez started his book by focusing on New Mexico's legacy of conquest. This was years before Patty Limerick used that title for her book. Um, he began with the Spanish conquest, but then quickly moved into the American op occupation of the region. Sanchez's critique of the US takeover of New Mexico was not focused on the actual event, but rather its aftermath. His view was at once incorporated into, into the United States. New Mexicans, most of whom, in his, in his estimation, were loyal to the new regime should then be treated equally. Instead, they had become stepchildren to a nation. As he said, the years immediately following the American occupation proved disappointing to those who had expected that the new order would bring them relief from the situation of deplorable civic affairs. For five years, the people of the region were denied territorial government. Civil and military powers became hopelessly entangled. The judiciary established by the military was in some instances of doubtful competence and in integrity. Army officials and their appointees exceeded their authority, violated their instructions from Washington, and were active in factional political movements. After the, pre after the Treaty of Peace in 1848, and until the organization of territory government in 1851, the administration of public affairs in New Mexico was in turmoil. The region was neither territory nor state. Not only were Me Mexican laws not enforced, but the Congress of the United States had failed to provide for the region and the affairs of New Mexicans. Thus, for Sanchez, the war and its aftermath were not, was not bad in itself. What was worse was that the United States did not fulfill the promises of citizenship to New Mexicans if not all ethnic Mexicans in the nation. His views are reflective of his generation's fight for inclusion. Rather than dwell on what caused the situation, Mexican-American activists sought to make their reality better by fighting for inclusion and equality. Now, in the 1960s, of course, the tide would turn and the US war with Mexico would be seen as an unjust conflict by many. Surprisingly, Robert Kennedy expressed what seems like a very li liberal, if not risky, view of the war while on a State Department tour of Asia in February 1962. While there, Kennedy, who was, of course, the president's brother at the time, and, of course, the attorney general, of the United States, because that's the way that Kennedy's wrote. Um, he visited the, uni the University of Indonesia and gave a speech outlining US support for that country. During the question and answer period, a student brought up the US war with Mexico, and Kennedy replied, I would say that as far as the war in Mexico, although there might be some from Texas who might disagree, I would say we were unjustified 
I don't think that this is a very bright spot in American history. Although his remarks were received well in Indonesia, they were greeted with less acclaim in Texas. And he later told a press conference that he had been instructed to clear any reference of the Lone Star State with Lyndon Johnson. In August of 1963, Kennedy brought up the incident in Indonesia when he delivered an address before the, the, the American GI Forum, a Mexican-American civil rights group uh, composed mainly of veterans. Um, they were meeting at their convention at the Conrad Hilton Hotel in Chicago. As would be expected from a politician, he put a twist on his uh, previous remarks, or his original remarks. No doubt he was trying to court the Latino vote in anticipation of his brother's run for the for re-election. In words that echoed John, George I. Sanchez's, Kennedy told the gathering, Early last year, I mentioned that I thought the United States had been unjustified in its war with Mexico. That I didn't think it was a, a very bright chapter in our history. And as you may remember, the remark touched off a minor storm of protests here at home, mainly from Texans. It didn't seem to matter to most of the angry letter writers that they were confusing the Mexican War with the Battle of the Alamo and the Texans fight for independence, which was, had taken place some years before. But I should certainly wish to add that many pages of American history have indeed been brightened by our war with Mexico. Not so much in terms of territorial gains as in the great gain of human resources. Had it not been for the war, many of you here today would not be Americans. For your birthplace might, not, might, have, not, may, might have been national territory of the Republic of Mexico. And we are without question a stronger and better nation today because we can number so many Spanish speaking among our own. A true politician. Um, <laughs> Kennedy went on to praise Latino war heroes, sport figures, and members of Congress. However, rather than simply sugarcoating the speech to the Civil Rights Organization, Kennedy went on to discuss the problems faced by Hispanics. As he said, for all these impressive gains, far too many of your people are still the victims of poverty and social and economic discrimination. Kennedy went on to discuss education, the low rates of high school, graduation among Spanish-speaking citizens and admitted that, quote, we are not helping them nearly as much as we could. He also told the crowd that schools were, quote, overcrowded and understaffed and went on to tie poor education to the inability of Latinos to get good paying jobs and in effect continuing a cycle of poverty. Of course, given that he was speaking before the GI Forum, those in attendance were not suffering these conditions and Kennedy knew this. Thus he asked that they be engaged with the cause of uplifting their fellow Latinos. Not because you are not, not because you are Spanish speaking Americans, but because you are American. The speech, the speech also discussed the test ban treaty and ridding the world of, of the threat of nuclear destruction yet justified building the nation's military defenses in order that the United States, quote, can stand without fear as a champion of peace and democracy for all men. Clearly this was a speech to court this group's, if not all Latinos' votes. And although it is commendable that Kennedy recognized that the Mexican War was perhaps unjust, he did, he did seem to understand, he did not seem to understand, I'm sorry, as Reese the Burden and Sanchez did, that the conflict set in motion the poverty and social economic inequality that he was talking about. There was a disconnect between the 19th century and the reality, century conflict and the realities of the late 20th century in, in his talk, it seems to me. The connection between the events of the 19th century and the realities of the 20th century was not lost on Mexican-Americans, especially young Mexican-American women and men coming of age in the 1960s, who forged a series of actions and events that we call the Chicano Movement. In 1956, uh, a few years before the decade began, Reyes Lopez de Herina went to New Mexico 
and met with the people of Tierra Amarillo, who had lost their land, grants, or ejidos as he called them. In his rambling autobiography, Mi Lucha por la Tierra, Lopez de Herina wrote that when he asked for the titles of their land, they responded that they did not have them. He then tells his reader that when he informed these men that the, quote, same lawyers who represented us and the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo had stolen your titles, they responded by saying, we don't know that treaty. We thought that Guadalupe Hidalgo was a man who had been president of Mexico. Lopez de Herina took up their cause and together with others founded La Alianza Federal de Mercedes, whose purpose was to organize and acquaint heirs of all Spanish land grants covered by the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo. La Alianza went on to launch a series of protests in order to regain those land grants and to empower New Mexicans in general. Ultimately unsuccessful, that struggle continues today. L Lopez Sejina's efforts and that of others like Cesar Chavez would inspire young people who became Chicano activists. Now, perhaps the group that captured the imagination of most Chicano activists was the Brown Berets. Founded in 1966 as Young Citizens for Community Action, the group changed its name a year later when, as a symbol of their militancy, they adopted their eponymous cap. The group gained notoriety during the 1968 East Los Angeles high school blowouts. A series of student walkouts of, at four schools spurred by the unequal educational conditions that Kennedy had discussed and pupils experienced. Uh, to his credit, um, Kennedy met with some of those students, I should have put the picture up, I'm sorry, to discuss, to show his, his show of support. Although one of them, Harry Gamboa, said that there was little substance to that meeting, but we do have a, a great picture of the event, which I'm not showing you. But Harry Gamboa in the picture is doing this. He has a peace sign, basically, and he says that, you know, they never actually talked to him, but it's a great picture. Um, and so, one of the things that's going to happen is the Berets are going to go on to organize the Chicano movement, the largest protest against the Vietnam War, which consisted of 20,000 to 30,000 people marching through the streets of East Los Angeles in August 29, 1970, and eventually ended in violence. The Berets and other Chicano activists subscribed to the notion of Aslan, first expressed in the plan of that name, and it proclaimed at the Chicano Youth Liberation Conference in Denver, Colorado in 1968. This manifesto basically argued that the Southwest constituted the homeland of the Aztecs, which legend said had traveled from the north to the south, where they eventually founded what became the city of Tenochtitlan, which is of course today the Mexican capital. The concept of Aslan constituted a counter-narrative to the effects of the U.S.-Mexico War. It defied the notion of conquest and instilled the sense that the ceded Mexican territories would never truly be American because they remain part of a greater and perhaps more spiritual Mexico. The Berets took inspiration from this notion and it, along with their overall sense of American injustice, led to more protests. Perhaps the group's most symbolic action was the August 1972 invasion of Santa Catalina Island off the Southern California coast where they remained for nearly a month until September 22nd. Um, the, the pretext for the incursion was their contention that the isle, along with the other China islands off the California sh shore, had, been had not been included in the land ceded to the United States by the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo. The invasion was undoubtedly inspired by a similar action the American Indian movements takeover of Alcatraz Island in San Francisco Bay from November of 1969 to June 1971. When on August 30th, 1972, uh, in, when on August 30th, 1972, in Project Topolote, Project Al, 26 berets marched off uh, the Catalina Ferry and set up camp on land owned by the Santa Catalina Island Company. They attracted considerable public attention. They left when asked to go by a judge, William Osborne, 
who accompanied by county sheriffs told them that they were in violation of an Avalon ordinance. Avalon is a city in Catalina Island, uh, prohibiting camping in an area zoned for single family dwellings. Following the warning, they unceremoniously abandoned Camp Cocolote. But you know, here it is, their picture it is very kind of symbolic. It's not the best picture. Um, but when it's been projected like that, it changes its resolution, I guess. Um, but what's going on with them is, you know, this once again is a symbolic action. And this is what they were known for. But again, they're reading they're reading the, the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo in a certain way, right? And they're saying, they're looking to see like what's left out, and they're saying, this land is ours once again. Um, now, as the Chicano movement waned in the late 1970s, so too did the references and perhaps the memory of the U.S. war with Mexico, if not the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo. However, the border that the war and the treaty had wrought gained a new significance with the publication of Gloria Anzaldúa's Borderlands La Frontera, the New Mestiza. This book, which Ramón Gutiérrez um, has said is a combination of history, much of it wrong, poetry, essays, and philosophical gems, in which Anzaldúa describes her fractured identity an identity fractured by not only the reality of the border between the United States and Mexico, but also numerous borders in her life. And this can be found in Ramon's splendid article, Community, Patriarchy, and Individualism, The Politics of Chicano History and the Dream of Equality, published in the American Quarterly. Anzandua discussed the injustices of the Mexican War and the Treaty of Guadalajara, as others had, but she then went further and identified its more violent aftermath in a graphic, if not poetic, manner. As she said, the gringo locked into the fiction of white superiority sees complete political power, stripping Indians and Mexicans of their land while their feet were still rooted in it. Con el des, des, desiero y el exilio fuimos des, desuniados, desrogados, des, des the street battles, and we were jerked by the roots, truncated, disemboweled, disposed, and separated from our identity and our history. Although Gloria Anzaldúa was in some ways, I forgot to do that, was in some ways um, saying what others had said about the war and its aftermath, there was one key difference, I think, in what she's saying, and then she included Indians. Chicano activists, for the most part, had never really thought about that, although they made alliances with Indian activists here and there. They weren't articulating that in their Blanda Aslan, for instance. I also want to note that although Anzal Dua is usually cited when discussing the new alliterations of borderlands history that has emerged in the last 20 years, her emphasis on the violence that occurred in the making of the border is usually ignored, except for maybe, maybe one or two books, and the emphasis on hybridity and cross-cultural interactions is brought to the forefront. Now, in the present, it seems that the knowledge and the memory of the U.S. war with Mexico is all but lost. At least I find that in the case when I, at least I find this in the, when is the case where where I teach on the U.S.-Mexico border, my students seem to be hungry to learn about the conflict, and they have. Um, Pages here. They have maybe heard about it. Uh, this makes sense to me given that some in the region do not think it is important. However, perhaps given the current political atmosphere that, that has once again made Mexicans, if not other Latinos, the scapegoats for the nation's economic ills, the U.S. war with Mexico might come back into the popular imagination of ethnic me Mexicans, if not, um, not the population if not the entire population in this generation. Of course, it seems to play into Donald Trump's notion of Mexico and Mexicans and how to deal uh, with the perceived threat of that country and its people. <clears throat> At a July 2015 speech before the conservative group Friends of Aid, Donald Trump, I'm not going to show a picture of him, but <laughs> uh, Donald Trump, Trump's notion of Mexican, Mex, uh, that at the July 2015 speech before the conservative group, 
Friends of Abe in Hollywood, California, Trump told the crowd that it was a mistake for the U.S. to invade, to invade Iraq and rid it of Saddam Hussein because it served as a buffer against a hostile Iran. He lamented that the United States should have invaded Mexico instead in order to stop the flow of its citizens into the country. Although he might be referencing history, Trump, like Kennedy before him, does not seem to understand that the present conditions of Mexican, Mexico and the fact that Mexicans come to the United States seeking a better life has all to do with the fact that it lost its war with its northern neighbor. So in referencing this history, he seems to be forgetting once again, right? It sent in motion these forces, right, of the kind of neo-colonial, if you will, relationship that Mexico has to the United, to the United States. Now, as I said at the beginning of the talk, the, United, the U.S. war with Mexico has loomed large in my mind for a long time. The historians, writers, Mexican-American Chicano activists and politicians that I have discussed have also grappled with and used the memory of the war to advance their aims. While I have, while I have channeled my memory through the writing of history, others have taken another approach. For example, this picture that was on the poster, that beautiful poster that's over there. Um, uh, Arturo Rista, an East Los Angeles artist, expressed it via the silkscreen print, Welcome to Aslan. It seems that via this piece, Rista is trying to convey the notion that regardless of the war and its imposition of the border, Mexicans in the U.S. and Mexico are one, and they dwell in a place called Aslan that exists in the mind in an unreimagined map. Thank you. history, also in view of popular culture in the United States, and this memory probably dominating the vision of the Mexico-US war. I'm, I'm thinking of, of, of Pedro Segundo's El Alamo, which of course, as I said, is not the same story, but it's kind of the same context of this history of violence. Is there, a, is there an intent of rewriting um, this memory from Mex not Mexican American perspective, but really from a Mexican perspective. You know, I'm really not sure. Having to be, not being a Mexican historian, to be honest with you, I'm really not sure. I would think that, as you just said, that there is. I think that um, uh, Sofia Vasquez. Vasquez is one of the leading authors of this. Um, I'm not familiar. I'm really not familiar with the historiography of the Mexican War from the Mexican side, which is something that I grappled with a long time ago because I did want to know it, but there was, it was at one point in my life, it was, a, it was important, a very important thing I think in my life. I remember in that class I talked about with um, Gary Nash, there was a, a, my attempt to try to do that. And uh, I was very successful only because I had no real guidance as to like, you know, what, what was that history basically. And I think that that's what happens. Um, in a sense, because of our training sometimes, you know, that we're trained in, I was trained in U.S. history. Um, I do know that, you know, years ago, in a very kind of, I was looking for this quote, actually, which is a, which in some ways is kind of a, well, I'm just gonna say it's kind of a wacky quote that, that Carlos Fuentes, I remember reading in LA Weekly, had said that um, if you looked into the minds of Mexicans, you were able to put a television screen into their minds, that the first thing you would see would be the conquest of Mexico, and then the second thing that you would see would be the invasion of the north in Mexico. So I think it looms in the minds of, of Mexicans still today. I'm not quite sure what scholars are, are saying about it. I do know also that you know it is called the War of the North American Invasion in Mexico, and of course there is the museum that's at, at Chapultepec that does just that, and it takes you through it, basically. Um, I think that, that 
that I, I think that you know would be a very much different conception, and I think that that probably looms larger in the popular imagination in Mexico than it does in the U.S. among Mexican Americans. I find that you know, and I think that has to do a lot with the fact that you know, it's just not taught in schools, right? For to Mex you know, Vladi uh, Garcia, who teaches at UC Santa Barbara, was telling me the other day that when he was an, an un when he was a graduate student at University of Texas El Paso in the 1960s that he was working, he was a TA for somebody, and that this professor said to him, you know, we're running out of time. I'm gonna skip the Mexican War. I'm gonna go right to the Civil War. <laughs> and I was like, you know, I think that still happens there. So, um, I don't know the historiography, I don't know what the latest is on the Mexican scholars. Yes? Um, no, quite how to put this. Perhaps I ask uh, about Greenberg's book on the Wicked War, mm -hmm. and the fact that it evokes a considerable antipathy to Polk in the Mexican War by the abolitionists, Thoreau, mostly abolitionists, yes. Thoreau, etc., very much against the war. So there was a, that. That means there was a strong anti-Mexican War feeling at that time, and uh, Grant himself said there was a wicked war subsequently to it. Uh, he recognized the wicked war. I, I, my question is the degree to which there has been an undercurrent in, in the United States of deep ambivalence or bad feeling about that war that is expressed in both positive and negative ways, negative attitudes towards the number of, of Spanish-speaking people here in the United States. And, in positive ways, in terms of taking the implications of war, of course, there was regretful feelings about I think the largest land grab in the history of the world. There has not been a war that has been so gratifying in terms of land that is taken as a consequence of it, and some deep feeling in American among Americans, the abolitionists, Grant, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, despite Smith and other people like them, of uh, of uh, that it's not completely forgotten, in other words. Occasionally it can be right. evoked again, and right. I think uh, Reimer's book, The Wicked War, is an example of it. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Is that, does that come to a question for you to the degree to which there is, though we might say nobody pays attention to Mex the Mexican War anymore, there is, as a consequence of that war, a deep feeling among Americans that, Jesus, manifest destiny, certainly took a hell of a lot there, unjustifiably. Does that come to a question? I think that, well, I think that what happens is that it depends on where we are in, in, in yeah. politics, right? It comes and goes. It comes and goes. So, you know, I know that during the, during the Vietnam War, of course, it was reinterpreted, right? There's a book by the name, there's a book called Mr. Polk's War, which is basically, you know, which was John Schroeder, I think, who wrote basically that, you know, he equated Polk with Johnson, right? He basically, said, you know, like, that's the same kind of thing that's going on. And I think that, you know, the, I think that Amy Greenberg's book can be perhaps read as, a, you know, being, being published or being conceptualized during this time when, you know, there has been a war, a conquest, if you will, right, in the Middle East. It's been going on for, what, 14 years now? So I think that, so I think that it comes back, right? I think that we keep reexamining wars, and I think that, you know, they, you know, when I wrote this, let's put it this way, when I wrote this little book on the U.S.-Mexico War, and it was sent out to readers, and it was, uh, it came out in 2007, so it was around 2006 that I got a report from one of the, they sent it out to like seven, seven readers, basically, and then you come up with a report, they come up with like a plan for you to do this, to, to do the, do the revisions, but I got, uh, at the very, very end, when it was going to be published, and I had talked about all these things because in the in this book I do have the abolitionists, I have the row, I have all these people are who are in opposition to the war, but then I also have people that are for the war, like you know somebody like Whitman, right? And um, the person who worked at the press, one of the people who worked at the press, who had been a historian, who had gotten the job there because she had been a reader for the book, tried to stop it because she said that you know some of the things that I was saying. She had a very long report saying. Um, you know, some of these things just makes no sense. You know, like this whole thing of, of you know, how this led to other invasions in Latin America. Well, that never happened, she says in the report. 
never happened, according to her. There was no, and so I remember sent the report to somebody, and they annotated it, and they, when it, when it came to that, they put, um, uh, remember the main? You're right, you know, like, so, so the, you know, like there was a kind of denial on this person's part, who was a historian, a U.S. historian, who just, you know, even, you know, I call it an imperial war, right? I call it a, a war for imperialism, and I remember when I wrote that for the proposal, one of my colleagues who was reading it, this very nice person was reading it and said, like, are you saying that the U.S. is an imperial power in the 19th century? <laughs> and I said, no, I yeah, uh, yes, I am. <laughs> and she said, oh, no, I don't, I, don't, I don't think that happens until later. I really don't think that happens until later. Right, so, and you know, that was a, a number of years ago. So I think that, you know, like our notion of what the war was keeps changing and we use it for kind of our own advantage, I think, right? And we reference it, and those of us who know about it. And even then, you know, like I think that Kennedy's, Kennedy's words are kind of telling what he says, which I think the same thing would happen today in Texas, right? It's like you say something against the war, and they're like, what are you saying against the Alamo? And then you go like, wait a minute, that didn't happen during the Mexican War, it happened before, right? So there's no kind of real sense of that history. Um, I think Amy Greenberg's book, I haven't read Amy Greenberg's book, I know about it, but you know, I think that, um, you know, it's one of these prizes. I think that a, I think that a, a kind of literate kind of group of Americans who read popular history are reading that book, and I think perhaps it's changing people's ideas. It's not forgotten. Well, my argument is it's not really forgotten. Okay. It's on some deep level, it keeps reasserting it itself. Yeah, no, I think you're right. I think it, it, it keeps coming back. Yeah. But once again, I think it depends on where we are in like kind of history and what's going on in the world today. Uh, let me go to the back and then I'll go to you then. Yes. Uh, thank you so much for the presentation. Thank you. I wanted to read that um, comment you said about the connection between Aslan and Mexico, mm -hmm. uh, and how you were illustrating that you know there's still a strong connection. However, like, what well, can we really say that there is that kind of connection when you know highlighting Anza and how she says you know neither here and neither, neither there. Uh, you know, to what extent would Mexico be accepting of like something like Islam and that connection? Yeah, I'm not sure. I think that um, I think that I know more than Me Mexican Americans. I think that Mexicans. You know, I went to Mexico City last year. I was doing research on this project on Ramon de Varan. The thing that I was most struck with at one point when I was having a conversation with somebody, he said to me, "You know, you speak Spanish with an American accent." And I was like, I speak Spanish with an American accent? And he said, yes. And I'm like, I wanted to say, you don't know what an American accent really is, because it may not be a Mexican accent, but it's not an American accent at the same time, right? So I think that, you know, like the kind of understanding of like, you know, Mexican Americans and that experience is something that people don't really know, right? That, although, you know, at the same time, what's interesting about it is, you know, I teach on the border where, you know, I get Mexicans in this 10% of the population of, UTEP is, New York State is El Paso, we call it UTEP, is Mexican, right? And they don't seem to understand it either, right? But I think that the interesting thing about it is that they're always kind of looking towards the U.S. and culture and everything else, right? So I think that one of the things that's happened is that there is a kind of um, lack of understanding culturally, but there is a real kind of understanding of like, you know, the kind of loomingness of the U.S., right? And so I think that, you know, on the Mexican side, perhaps people are not saying, like, those Mexican-Americans are brethren, are people. But, you know, like, you meet, I meet so many, I meet so many Mexican-Americans who are like, I'm Mexican, right? And you say, uh, well, you know, you're really not, right? You're Mexican-American, right? And you know, in El Paso, I have, there's this whole thing where people say Hispanic all the time, right? And in Los Angeles, where I'm from, people would say, you know, for me, Los Angeles people would say, I'm Mexican. In, in El Paso, people do not say I'm Mexican. They say I'm Hispanic. Um, I was talking to my class the other day that, you know, like the Mexican in El Paso is like a private, it's like what, you know, like what Richard Rodriguez talks about, the language, Spanish being a private language. I think that like, in some ways, Mexican is a private identity that's only in the home in some places because you don't want to be confused, you know, with that Mexican from the other side, right? So I think that there is a, a disconnect. I think that, you know, 
I think that Mexican Americans, Chicanos perhaps, long for Mexico. The farther away you're from there, and you know, I think that more and more what happens is you know more recent immigrants have this sense, and you know they visit much more often. You know, my family never went to Mexico because we couldn't afford to go to Mexico. And you know, we're from the northern part of Mexico too, right? We're from my parents are from Ciudad Juarez. So there's a different kind of connection to Mexico, or there's a, it doesn't go both ways, put it that way. I think that's what you're saying to me. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, I had a, a, a question about two features of uh, the war uh, that came out of the treaty mm -hmm. uh, that you touched on in, in your lecture, mm -hmm. and that have been emphasized by other historians, uh, such as uh, Richard uh, Griswold de, uh, de Castillo, uh -huh. in terms of thinking about the, the long-term legacy of, of this war. And uh, those two features are um, the citizenship provision that was defined uh, by Article 8 of the treaty, and also the international boundary, the border itself. And it seems to me that over the course of the 19th century, the 20th century, and through the 21st century, those two particular provisions that came out of the U.S.-Mexico War and out of the treaty have been reinscribed and sort of re-articulated in, in many different ways. And we've seen this in terms of uh, a, di a harder division between the United States and Mexico, um, and also a sort of re-inscription um, re of the idea of citizenship uh, that is particular to Mexican Americans or to Mexicans. Um, and I was wondering if you could say a little bit more about um, the different um, variations that you see of these two concepts across time, because your lecture very nicely sort of traces the evolving understanding of the conflict. Um, but I'm wondering if you could say a little bit more about um, citizenship on the one hand, and then sort of the border itself as, as uh, ideas that were um, also in flux over this period of time. Okay. I, you know, I'm thinking in particular about the fact that um, you, you end very nicely with this notion of Azatlan as a broader community that spans the, the border itself. Um, and this um, goes along with you know, the North American Free Trade Agreement and international migration and other sort of trends that seem to defy the fact that a border exists at all between the United States and Mexico. Yet at the same time, there's a tendency um, within both countries to sort of re-inscribe and re-emphasize um, the border itself. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, I think that, you know, once again, I mean, I think that that's an that's a interesting point. I agree with you that, the, that NAFTA kind of, you know, NAFTA kind of in some ways did away with the border, but it didn't do away with the border, but it just changed the economy, right? It totally changed the economy, especially in the North. I had a student who said, you know, that his family business was just destroyed because they, like, dealt with cars, basically. And, they were a car dealer in northern Mexico, in Chihuahua, and he said, you know, it destroyed our, it destroyed our business because, you know, we could no longer, you know, the, the cars were much cheaper, right? You could bring them over and stuff. And so I think that, you know, the border, um, yet at the same time, you know, like, even though goods are crossing, people aren't crossing, and there's these stipulations against people. I mean, when I first moved to El Paso, when I first got there, I remember we would go to Juarez, we went to Juarez, uh, every now and then. You could go over to Juarez, you could go have dinner, you could come back, and it would not take you that long. When people, my colleagues tell me that you know, it used to be that you could go for lunch. They would be teaching at UTEP, and they would go to Juarez for lunch. They would go to Sanborns or something, and come back and be able to teach their afternoon classes. That just can't happen anymore, right? So I think that you know, like we think about the border, the, the, idea, the ideas of the border just keeps changing. I think that one of the things that happens, of course, is that we, uh, we're tidying up the border constantly, yet people keep crossing it. And it's always looming in our minds, it seems to me. Um, you know, we just read, um, and even then, you know, like trying to define the border, we just read um, um, Line in the Sand by uh, Rachel St. John that talks about that, right? And how the border has changed over time and what they did with that. Um, so I think it has changed. I'm not quite sure. I mean, I think that you've answered the question, to be quite honest with you, that you know it has changed. It changes over time. It um, I, yeah, you know, I don't think that we should ever say that you know we're going to get rid of that border anytime soon. You know, like the kind of regulations that are going that are going on there constantly. You know, people say El Paso is one of the safest cities in the nation. Well, it's the safest city in the nation because it's on the border. That's you know because there's so much security there, right? I remember recently, maybe two years ago, I took Felix Gutierrez and his wife to a little, on a little tour of El Paso. Felix used to teach at USC. 
and we get to this place that's like near UTEP. It's like down the street, basically. And we get to this fence, and I say to him, that's the Rio Grande right there. And it's just a fence, and it's unlocked. The gate is unlocked. And he says to me, no, it's not. That can't possibly be the Rio, be the Rio Grande. And I'm like, yes, it is. And he's like, no, it's a tributary. It has to be a tributary. And I'm like, no, no, it's the Rio Grande. That's it right there. And he looks it up on his iPhone, right? And sure enough, it was. And I said, you can cross over there right now if you wanted to, but the Border Patrol is right there. Like the Border Patrol will come and stop you. And you could see Mexicans get on the bus on the other side of it, right? So that, you know, like it's there, and you think that it's like, you know, easy to come go, you know, right there, you think it's so easy to just go across it, but it's not gonna happen because there's so much surveillance of that border, right, constantly. So I think that, you know, the spider notion that you know we can cross it very easily and that you know all these things are going on and it's still now it's omnipresent, it seems to me. Um, uh, uh, Professor Travis, thank you so much for uh, this uh, uh, presentation on how the Mexican American War has changed uh, throughout time, uh, especially the views of it, and how that has related to a political message. And that's the kind of question I wanted to ask you about how uh, a particular political message relates to terminology. Uh, and what I find here, uh, and this is something that I've had to wrestle with in my own work, is that I sometimes have trouble calling things that were maybe not conceived of at the time the way they were. So if we talk about Mexico going to war with the US and we think of them as nations, it's kind of complicated by the fact that Mexico is going through the civil war against the uh, Centralista, the Republic of right. and then the US is 13 years prior to the yeah. civil war. So, uh, can we call these nations would be, I guess, my first question. And if so, how does the work of like uh, Pekka Hanalian and uh, Brian DeLay complicate the matters where maybe there's another, there's a third player in the Apaches and the Comanches? And I ask that question because I'm interested in how that relates to a political message. Now now it's very important for a lot of like young uh, Mexican-American students, students in general, to learn that, uh, to learn this particular history that is absent in my home of Texas very much, you know? And uh, I wonder, when complicating the story, when it's not just Mexico versus the U.S., when it's uh, centralistas versus republicanos, when it's ricos versus pobres, how that changes the message, how we can teach that message without watering down the fact that Latinos are in a, a particularly tough position uh, in the present, but it's not just because of a simple matter of uh, a war with Mexico, but that still is important. So I was wondering how, how you kind of navigate that and how you think of that. The yeah, that's a, I mean that's a that's a difficult question, right? Because I, I mean I think you're absolutely right. I think that you know Brian Delay and and um, book, especially Brian Delay's book, right? I mean Brian Delay's book is all about just that, right? That you know the reason why this is going on, the reason why Mexico is so weak during this time is because they're fighting these Mexicans, they're fighting these Indians, right? And so it weakens. And you know, although I think sometimes he overstates, and Brian is a friend of mine, but I think he overstates the fact sometimes. You know, like he basically says. You know, Mexicans, at one point he says, Mexicans were happy to see the Americans because the Indians had come into their villages already and decimated it, and they were happy when the conquerors came in, basically. You know, I'm not sure about that. I think that, you know, one has to be careful about that. But maybe that's just me, like, subscribing to a very kind of nationalistic idea as well. But, uh, but I think that, yeah, I think that, that it changes our notion of what the nation was. I think that you're right. I don't think that there was a... I think that there's people that are leaders of, of Mexico at the time. I, one of the things that I was really struck with, with Brian DeLay's book that he talks about is, and you know, people always talk about this, is the turnover in presidents during that time, right? There's something like 30 presidents during that time, right? And what I remember saying to my class, because he keeps, you know, in some ways Brian DeLay you know, talks about how like, you know, these are fumbling Mexicans, basically, is what he says, right? That they just can't get their act together and, I think there's a bit of that, that's, in, that's true, but at the same time, what I wondered was, why do people want to be president of Mexico? They're fighting so hard to be president of Mexico. They're killing each other to be president of Mexico, right? They keep, like, getting rid of people. There's all these coups, and, right? This is what's going on there. So there's a notion, right, I think, of this kind of imagined community, right? And I think that, I think that you know, perhaps thinking of it that way, right, that it is information, that it is imagined, it depends on who you are, as to like what your class is, 
And you know, like what your race is, although we don't really talk about race when we think about Mexico all that much, right? But I think all those factors come together, and I think it complicates the story of the U.S.-Mexico war, right? So that it's not just about nations per se fighting each other, but then it's also about, you know, like these Indian groups, and what does that mean for sovereignty of that, those groups, right? And how do we include those groups in this discussion, right? Although, at the same time, I think it's it's difficult. It's a difficult thing because you know, like, are, were the Comanches an empire? I mean, is that the terminology we're going to use? Empire, right? It's like I think that we need to be careful about terms like that at the same time, right? So I think that it complicates our story more. I think that at the same time, you know, when you're teaching a class on this, as you probably know, you've done this, you've done this. It's like you know, when you're teaching a class, you need to make a complex, but at the same time package it in a way that's going to make sense to some people, right? So I think of taking these themes, right, and you know, saying things like, you know, like, what is a nation? Are Indians nations, right? Uh, does it bring them in, right? Is it a kind of like a triangular kind of thing? But even then, are na Indians are not a unified nation in any way, right? I mean, they're not, they're different groups. Would know better than I do. <laughs> yeah. They're different groups, right? I mean, are they, are they unified for the most part? This, this is a, a topic that we can potentially discuss in greater detail um, after, uh, during the reception. Okay. But I'd, I'd like to, uh, to break it uh, here uh, to thank everybody for coming to uh, this very illuminating lecture on a poorly understood topic in U.S. Mexican history. And to thank Dr. Chavez for uh, traveling from the board. That's true. Thank you.